Welcome everyone. My name is Janine Pesh. I am the founder and creative director of Range. My pronouns are she and her. I am tuning in to, to you from the ancestral lands of the Salatu, Squamish, and Musqueam um, nations in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, our conversation today is going to be a incredibly insightful and I'm hoping we can cover quite a few topics of this very large subject within the hour. Um, we, um, in addition to uh, publishing a magazine and a creative agency, we recently launched a new product called the Horizon Report, which is a weekly report geared towards industry insiders. It's actionable insights about um, what to do, why it matters, and how to take action. And um, we will be uh, actually sharing a free month subscription to all the registrants of this newsletter um, after. So please uh, let us know if you have questions about that. Um, I wanted to give a special thank you and a warm welcome to our group that's joining us today. Um, in celebration of Earth Month, um, our session today is focused on outdoor archival content. We'll be chatting with academics and archivists about the role they play in preserving the history of outdoor gear and why it matters. Um, I'm gonna introduce my co-moderator, Chase Anderson. Hey everyone. Thanks, Janine. Yeah, my name is Chase Anderson. I'm the program coordinator here at uh, Utah State University's Outdoor Product Design and Development Program. That uh, title is kind of a catch-all, uh, but I, I do all of our industry outreach and marketing. Um, and then I've, uh, along with Clint Pumphrey, who I know is in attendance, who's our corporate arch or our archivist here at Utah State, um, we set up the Outdoor Recreation Archive um, here at the university. And, and you know, some of you probably have found that through Instagram, uh, the Outdoor Rec Archive there um, that I help manage. All right, let's jump into this. Our first guest today um, that we're going to chat with is Dr. Rachel Gross. She is the Assistant Professor of History and Co-Director of the Public History Program at the University of Colorado in Denver. Um, welcome, Dr. Gross. We're really pleased to have you here joining us. Um, I'll do my best to keep us on track. We could probably spend three hours talking to you. Um, such a breadth of knowledge in the industry and the space, and it's we're I'm so grateful to have you here. I guess let's start with some simple questions. Uh, what do you do, and um, where are you based right now while you're working from home? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks so much for having me here. Um, I'm in Denver, Colorado. Um, and my work as a professor means that I teach classes in business history and history of capitalism women and gender history and public history. So if you think about the folks who are working professionally in archives, collections management, um, or acting as historians for brands, I train some of those students through my um, uh, work with master students. Um, and overall, uh, what I do is I spend decades uh, looking at materials in the archives and then writing about it. Um, right now I'm working on a book on the history of the outdoor industry in the United States. I love it. How did you find this route, this path, um, this, this niche within the space? Um, what led you to it? Well, all historians, um, like many of us, need to find a niche that no one else is doing. But the real origin of this research project was when I was much younger and going on a backpacking trip around the world. And I brought all the best stuff that I knew from the United States. And I got comments all along my journey about having too much stuff or having the wrong kind of stove or the wrong kind of jacket. And I realized that all the rules I had learned about the right way to get back to nature was actually very much an American story, right? Not that I was more correct, but rather that I had grown up learning the expectations and the norms of a particular culture. And so when I got back home and began graduate school, what I wanted to do was further understand where this notion that Americans needed to buy stuff on their way to the woods came from. You, this was really a trial by fire. You, you actually went out in the world with way too many things and discovered that Americans have this uncanny ability to have too much stuff. <laughs> and that led you down this path, which I think is really fascinating. Um, where did it really begin? I mean, we look back in the history of outdoor culture and obviously, we need to ensure that we um, take into account um, the legacy of and the ancestral the ancestral knowledge that we have learned and gleaned over the years from indigenous people, indigenous cultures. You know, was that a place where you, it really started to resonate and a lot of the dots started to connect? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So we do need to go back to the middle of the nineteenth century to understand the origins of the industry. Because that, around the end of the Civil War, is about when modern outdoor recreation started. It's not that no one went hunting, fishing, camping in the decades or centuries before that. Of course people did. But for the most part, 
People who slept outside were doing so out of necessity because they were prisoners, they were soldiers, or they uh, um, were indigenous people to the United States. Um, whereas the um, uh, decades after the Civil War, people started to go out to nature for leisure. They were seeking a kind of physical experience to recover some part of their authentic past, they thought. And that's when companies started forming to cater to these new kinds of tourists. So we do need to understand that Americans' impulse to get back to nature is very much tied up with the erasure of Native peoples from the wild places that got preserved in the 19th century, right? To imagine the, the wilderness as unpeopled is central to the notion of what it means to get back to nature in the United States. And many outdoor companies in the, at the turn of the 20th century relied on that mythology of the frontier, the notion of the disappearing Indian, even as they marketed Indian styled products um, based on the aesthetics of uh, Native American design to white customers in the early 20th century. Hmm. White people ruining things since forever. <laughs> um, I'm wondering again then, so how, okay, so we look back and this is the very, beginning of where this journey starts in terms of our knowledge and understanding and, and, and collecting even and starting to really look back on the very initial DNA of, of how gear starts to come together. Um, and we know that um, gender also plays a big role in this and how people perceive to express themselves um, through that lens. Um, how do we start to look at um, the evolution of outdoor gear through the lens of, of gender and identity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think this audience won't be surprised to hear that masculinity is a key part of American outdoor culture. This dates back again to the early days of the outdoor industry when many guidebooks recommended that aspiring outdoor people make their own buckskin suits. Now, this was a skill that many Native American in the women in the Central Plains had, and in fact, these aspiring outdoorsmen didn't make their own suits, but they liked the idea of it because it thought they thought that if they could show their craft skill, right, to hunt their deer, to skin the material, to make the clothing, that they would exemplify these masculine values that they were hoping to recover from the American frontier past that they imagined. And so this uh, interesting notion, right, the idea that you should be making your own stuff, but in fact, many men only talked about that, but really were relying on the invisible labor of Native women, um, helped to kickstart this notion that what people acquire in the you know, course of going about their outdoor adventures is necessity. It's equipment and it's functional rather than stylish, fashionable, and feminine. In other words, from the earliest days of the industry, buying outdoor clothing and gear became coded as masculine, even as both men and women were participating in the sport. And to some extent, that stereotype persisted throughout the 20th century. Again, even acknowledging that women have been central to the outdoor industry as gear designers, manufacturers, and of course, as participants themselves throughout this whole period. Wow, it's loaded. Um, I know that you started to unpack some of this in the podcast you did with Chase. And I'd, I'd love everybody to, um, maybe we could drop that link in the chat as well. Um, Dr. Gross did, has done several podcasts actually with, with Chase um, covering this at great length. So again, we're just gonna be able to like skim over some of these incredibly important topics, but if you'd like to dig deeper, we can drop those links in the chat so everybody can access them. Um, what happens after the war? I mean, we learn a lot from, you mentioned that, you know, soldiers, we learn not a ton after World War I, but quite a lot after World War II, correct? About um, functionality and performance apparel and fibers, which at the time is wool and, and cotton. So maybe you can, you can fast forward to, and jump into that a little bit. Sure. Um, there are deep links between the outdoor industry and the US military. And that dates back to the fact that the US military had very little cold weather or extreme weather expertise. And so when they, both in World War I and World War II, were looking for con civilian consultants, but also equipment manufacturers to help create the material that they needed to fight two wars, they turned to the outdoor industry. And so that means during World War II, names that many of you will know, like Eddie Bauer and L.L. Bean and Harold Hirsch of Hirsch Weiss or White Stag in Portland, Oregon, all served as consultant to the quartermaster corps. So they helped to design the new military uniforms, especially for cold weather, especially for the ski troopers. And in turn, they took many of the lessons of scientific approaches to testing clothing and equipment 
in laboratories back with them to their own companies. And so World War II really is a turning point because it means that um, this scientific approach to testing in labs as well as out in the field trickles down to the outdoor industry. And at the same time, the production of clothing and equipment for millions of soldiers led to a huge surplus of material. And we all know about army surplus stores. They flourished in the years 1946, 47, and 48. Many of these small stores popped up in places where there weren't previously specialty outdoor stores, right? Of course, in Boulder and Seattle and the Bay Area, people were able to access high-end equipment. But after World War II, ordinary middle-class Americans all over the country were also able to access these kinds of goods. They weren't always excellent, but they were finally affordable. And that made a big difference in terms of spreading new ideas about scientific high-end equipment to the masses of the United States. So we're still seeing a huge influence, like a huge military influence, you know, whether that's from a functional standpoint or an, or an aesthetic standpoint um, on modern apparel. Why do you think it's had this like lasting impact or this lasting influence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really a question about culture and history. Um, so I love it, of course. Um, and I think the answer is that militarism is a big part of American culture. So much like the myth of the American frontier that has been debunked for over a century, um, I see kind of aesthetic nods and even archival photos appearing in contemporary outdoor catalogs and magazines that reference both, both the American military past and the American frontier past. And or, in other words, these myths about rugged, authentic men of the past, usually a very narrow set of men, have a lot of power in our own society in the 21st century. And I see that marketers often invoke those stereotypes rather than thinking about the new, um, more inclusive approaches to um, what is our outdoor history and what should our outdoor future be. So we're still seeing those impacts, obviously, to your point. Um, and we're at, you know, right now in the process of kind of decoupling and dismantling this idea that we've created of masculinity or identity within the outdoor space um, and, and making it more accessible. So it's fascinating how obviously far it goes back. Um, and you did mention that there was this very pivotal turning point um, after the Civil War, and I'm assuming, you know, fast forward after World War II, and some of the programs that were launched, like the Civilian Conservation Corps, part of the New Deal, um, these programs that were meant to get more people outdoors and more comfortable in the outdoors from a recreational standpoint. Was this a big turning, pivotal turning point mm -hmm. in American history? Yeah, all of those contexts that you mentioned, I think are really important. Perhaps many in the audience here would expect that it's the 1970s that I would point to as the most important turning point. And indeed, it does matter a lot because we see a flourishing and participation as well as a number of new companies uh, opening during that time. But actually, as a historian, I feel it's my obligation to push us to look back even further. I would say the early 20th century is probably the most important turning point for us because that's when companies like Abercrombie and Fitch began marketing this notion of the outdoor man and the outdoor woman with the right kind of clothes. Mm -hmm. Before this era, um, many Americans couldn't afford vacations. They certainly weren't going camping on a regular basis, and they didn't have specialty attire just for leisure time activities. But in the early 20th century, Abercrombie and Fitch, as well as many others, came in to fill that void just as Americans were gaining new rights through labor organizing that allowed them to take the time to participate in these activities. So the modern outdoor industry really starts at the turn of the 20th century. It coincides with the rise of mass consumerism, the national affordability of less expensive, though not cheap, goods. Um, and so we can really trace in the oldest of the catalogs, I would bet that uh, Utah State has in their collections really fun stuff. Um, the first kind of archetypes of the outdoor man and the outdoor woman enjoying nature outside that we still draw on today. That's incredible. Because um, we do tend to romanticize the 70s and even the 50s, you know, the golden era of climbing and, and that kind of the beginning of the Schoenard's um, dominance in the outdoor space. Um, and really, it goes back to those American retailers like Abercrombie and Fitch, which people probably don't even realize how far back they date and, and their headquarters, their multi-level, probably the first experiential store in New York City. Right. Um, and then um, in addition to that, L.B. and Eddie Bauer, again, these iconic American brands um, that also, often get overlooked now. Um, so that, that's really fascinating. Um, 
I did read your piece in the Science History Institute um, on the legacy of Bob Gore. And I know we don't have a ton of, of time with you here, but I'd love if you could maybe quickly, quickly um, talk about in broad strokes, you know, the impact that some of the ingredient brands have had on the evolution of the outdoor space and bringing um, performance into the, into the forefront of the conversation. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So um, we all know about Gore-Tex and of course there are many other important um, ingredients that go into the clothing and equipment that we all purchase as enthusiasts as well as participants in the industry in some way. I think that one of the lessons of Gore-Tex in the 1970s is that Gore helped to educate American consumers to recognize and have the vocabulary to talk about high-tech materials. Gore-Tex isn't something that you can see just by picking up a rain jacket. And certainly that wasn't the case when people had never heard of it in 1976 when the first early winter's rain suit came on the market. Um, and so the advertising that I look at in the 70s and early 80s is really all about teaching people how to see and most importantly, sense that Gore-Tex or other high-tech synthetics are working effectively, right? If you're feeling sweaty, it's probably not working. You're doing something wrong where there's something wrong with the jacket was the kind of education going on the advertising in magazines like Outside and Backpacker. And so I think when we ask about the history of ingredient brands, part of what we're looking at, of course, is what's going on in the manufacturing side, um, invention of new technologies. But really what's most interesting to me is this kind of cultural education through advertising that teaches people like me who don't know much at all about chemistry to talk in a somewhat intelligent manner about the materials inside of the clothing that I wear. And that's something that I see on an everyday basis now, whether people are talking about synthetics or something like merino wool, that they, they're able to be conversant in the same vocabulary that marketers um, and chemists are using as well. And it's almost, you know, that in itself is, is, a, is an entire design exercise, simplifying and breaking down and making something like that digestible. And now fast forward to, to, to 2020, um, 2021, and we have, you know, an entire movement inspired by Gore-Tex called Gore-Core, which I'm sure you've heard of, and I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit more, but why do you think there's this, you know, because that's such a thing right now, and this idea of like looking outdoorsy, even if we aren't outdoorsy, why do you think that's resonating with consumers so much? And this will be our last question with Dr. Gross, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we'll let her go. <laughs> well, just to, to highlight how unusual and weird that is in many ways that in American culture that outdoorsy is cool and stylish, um, there's an example in my research from the 1920s when someone wrote in his diary, you know, mom and I went camping this weekend. He's writing from the Bay Area in California, um, but she always changes out of her camping suit before she gets out of the car and goes back in the house because she doesn't want her neighbors to see. But the notion that with her tanned skin and her dirty khaki suit that the neighbors might see her was really unthinkable at that time. Fast forward to the end of the 20th century, of course, as you suggest, um, outdoorsy is cool. I think there are tons of answers to that, but a really good one is to think about um, the importance of fitness culture um, starting in the 1970s and 1980s, right? As a part of the kind of um, uh, 1980s conspicuous consumption focused on people's bodies being on display with the biggest and latest brands, I think the outdoor industry rode that wave somewhat reluctantly, in fact, right? Many outdoor companies were not eager to be considered preppy or hip in um, either in the north woods of Maine or in um, the streets of on the streets of New York City. But nonetheless, Americans embrace the idea that they might climb a mountain with the clothes that they're wearing, even if they're not about to, just in the same way that they embrace yoga pants, right? They're comfortable, they work well, and also being fit is a part of demonstrating status. And so I think a lot of the brands have worked uh, hard or reluctantly, perhaps, um, to establish themselves as a part of this fit, outdoorsy lifestyle um, that dates back to the late 1980s and early 1990s. And that's what the legacy is, what we're still experiencing today. And it's crazy because we've been talking so much about at the, in the work we do with range and this, this shift in consumer behavior and the shift in status and luxury and what we consider to be luxury. And I think coming out of quarantine or this last year, you know, access to the outdoors has actually risen to the list and, and become something that is quite valuable and more so than anything else. Um, so that probably plays a role in it as well. Um, Dr. Gross, I really appreciate your time. Again, we could spend hours with you. I'm sure anybody in this in this group here, please reach out to Dr. Gross or follow her um, along um, on her journey, uh, dismantling and 
learning and unlearning about the outdoor space. And um, we're going to move um, on to our next guest, David. And Chase, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gross, as well. Um, I've included links to um, her work, uh, website, a uh, few articles, as well as the previous podcasts that, that we've done um, as well, which are well worth your time to dive into. Um, so I, I get the privilege of introducing uh, Dave and, and talking with you a little bit about uh, your path into the industry, how you got into archives. Um, but Dave Moore is the Heritage and Digital Asset Manager at Carhartt. Um, so I guess, first of all, how did you, uh, well, what do you do? And, and how did you, or where are you based? Uh, so I, in, so obviously I'm the digital asset manager as well at Carhartt, but um, so that heritage manager title encompasses basically company archivist and historian. So archivist, historian, digital asset manager, and uh, I'm based out of uh, Dearborn, Michigan, which is just outside Detroit. Right. Where, how did you get into the archival space? What led you to this? Um, I know you and I just did a podcast recently that'll be coming back out in a couple of weeks where we dive in deeper, but um, how'd you get into this space first of all, and then what led you to Carhartt? Well, we don't, we don't have enough time for me to tell the full story. It was a rather circuitous path. Uh, I originally was a history teacher uh, and decided to go back to school for, um, for history. So uh, when I was doing my uh, MA program for history at Wayne State University in Detroit, uh, I just got really interested in the archive side of things. I took some classes. Uh, the program I was in let me take some classes in archives as well. And I just trended more towards that. That became a lot more um, interesting to me personally at the time. So I started working for a consulting company that did all sorts of work with um, businesses in both archives and digital asset management. Um, so I was working on a project and learned that that company was uh, talking with Carhartt because that was in 2014 and they were going to be celebrating their 125th anniversary uh, and never had a formal archive before. So they were looking to get it started. Um, so I started wearing my Carhartt clothes to work every day and asking my you know, bosses uh, what was going on with that uh, negotiation and all that. And uh, luckily was put on that initially to just catalog the materials that were there. Uh, to create a guide for when people wanted to dive in and, and reference the history. Uh, and it morphed over the last, you know, uh, for the ensuing years, it morphed into really just a huge demand within the company for historical knowledge, for expanding what was already known, for kind of, you know, uh, solidifying the the story that that had kind of always been there, but never you know, had that kind of research done behind it. So it really just snowballed to the point that uh, now we're really kind of a, an official department within the company and, and uh, provide expertise to all sorts of different people. I think it's really unique for any company to have a dedicated um, role to do this work. In, in other companies, it's done by committee. Um, in some brands, it's um, not happening at all. Um, or there's one individual who is, who's passionate about the work and is you know, kind of collecting things, saving, saving items. Um, so to be able to have someone in a dedicated role is, is really special. What, what, what does that role look like for you day to day? Um, and, you know, how does it feel being a part of helping preserve the legacy of a brand? Like, what, what is that like for you? Uh, I mean, it's, it's very exciting day to day. And especially because Carhartt is such an old company, you know, being, you know, being founded in 1889 and being, you know, 132 years old now is obviously was very daunting at the beginning uh, with no sort of formal work done on the, the things that had been saved. But um my day-to-day -day really it can encompass a lot of different things i'll kind of leave the the digital asset management side of it for now but history wise um you know it's all the traditional archival work so it's taking in um new materials either that i'm you know clothing that i'm purchasing or things that are being transferred from other departments within the company uh our facility our u.s production facilities that are in kentucky and tennessee uh, particularly in kentucky have been in the area <clears throat> and operating since like the 30s. So they're often finding boxes and things that they're sending to me. So it's all that stuff of the traditional archival work of taking in new things, processing the materials, getting them organized, searchable, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, the stuff that's really exciting for me is the creative stuff. So working with the marketing, both marketing and the product design department, um, to have influ heritage influence on new products, um, having influence on marketing campaigns. How can we bring our history into 
what we're talking about, you know, today and what we're creating that's new because Carhartt is a brand where we were founded on purpose-built clothing, high quality clothing, um, also from a kind of business operation and, and sort of morality standpoint, doing the right thing, uh, being very supportive of uh, union movements and all that um, in the early years. So, you know, being the, the expert as far as how the history backs up how we still operate today and what we're doing today is a hugely important part that kind of is the heritage manager sort of part of it. Um, sitting on teams to kind of say, you know, new things that we're working on and doing, is this in keeping with our history and who we are and what we started out as, you know, and and how that all connects to today. Well, to that point, and and maybe tying this back to to Dr. Gross and her work, um, mm-hmm. which was fascinating, at- by the way, I have to interject and just say I was riveted. So thank you, Dr. Gross. Well, it's it's looking at our industry within the context of larger events and how they impact each other, right? These larger imp- or events impacting our industry and the industry impacting the larger world. Um, you, you mentioned unions um, and Carhartt's involvement in some of these, you know, major movements and over over the years. Like, how important is is that for you to discover that history and tell that story of of the impact that Carhartt has had, uh, you know, on on the country, on the world, on on culture? Um, what, what's like that like for you? It's extremely important to me. Um, You know, we've always been a company that, you know, going back to our founder, Hamilton Carhartt, like, you know, you read his writings and he's always talking about how his employees are his friends and how, you know, he, he, how sentiment enters into the way that he runs his business all the time. So um, it's really important to me to make those discoveries. And, you know, I, again, I hate to use that word too, because so often you talk about discovering something in the archives or that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, it was there. Somebody processed it. It's been here. You know, it's people are discovering new ways to, to represent it and stuff, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it's it's really important to have the story solidified and to when you're talking, when your brand is talking today and talking about their values and and putting all those things out there, you know, the archive really serves as the place to have the backup, the ammunition to say, we mean what we say, because we have these things here and they're organized and they're reference, you know, we can reference them and and talk about these things um, to support what we're saying today. So it's really important to me to um, just create really get all the details into the story. You know, there was a lot of broad strokes that I, when I came in that it was always known we had the support, but, you know, Hamilton Carr testified in front of Congress in 1900 to talk about, you know, that was brought in by this industrial commission that was created by President McKinley to talk about labor issues and what he was doing at Carhartt. And, you know, you read testimony from other, you know, business leaders that were brought in and you see the variation and how they're talking about unions and and workers' rights and all those kind of things. So um, to be able to bring those, especially with still being a family company and still being a private, you know, family owned company and, you know, the descendants of the family still running the company, um, it's, it just makes it even that much more important. You and I have talked about this a little bit before, but sometimes we're we're both surprised or I, I'm dumbfounded sometimes um, by brands that don't have an archive or don't have someone who's who's taking care of the history because I think you and I have talked about this before, but when you're a company that's 50 years old or a hundred years old in your case, like you can't you can't replicate history. Like you can't you can't just make that up, that authenticity that comes with being a 50 year old brand, a 25 year old brand, a 50 year old brand, a 100 year old brand. And, and especially now, I mean, the consumer is so savvy, right? Like people want authenticity and, and you can't replicate being 100 years old and having that heritage. Um, what, what's, what's that been like for you? Have you seen that? I mean, obviously Carhartt is respected in that way and, and people go to it because it is a trusted and been around. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I'll kind of answer that with like an example, which was a really exciting project I worked on that we still kind of still has a legacy now. But but when I first came in, um, we were introducing at that time a product um, called Force Extremes, which was a Carhartt doing a dry fit t-shirt with 37.5 technology in it at the the time. We're kind of revamping that now. But um, the idea being that we're creating, this is Carhartt making dry fit clothing, you know, uh, it's not a, you know, six, six point seven five ounce cotton t-shirt that we're known for, you know, so, you know, there were these thoughts around 
do we create a, a thing where we're really pushing the tech and every little detail and trying to educate people on what exactly this technology is and what it does and, and getting in the weeds and all that kind of stuff. And we really just came up with this idea that we're an, we're an old brand that's been making trusted clothing and, and you know doing that for so long that really the upshot of the marketing should be, we're doing this new thing. It's new for us. We don't have the experience of some other brands in that part of the space, but we have at that time, you know, around 130 years of history of making high quality clothing. So the idea was show the new product, show people working in it and, and, and being in the outdoors in it, but then really make the focus of it, the history and how long we've been around and how long we've been making quality products. So we actually worked myself with uh, people on our design team and in Dearborn to create, you know, these patterns to recreate the old clothing, work with our sewers down in Kentucky to actually make historical reproductions of the old clothing to then weather and use and just do historical reenactments. So we picked key points throughout the history of the company, starting from where we began on the railroad, highlighting farming, highlighting the outdoors, our first kind of hunting and outdoors gear, all that stuff. And we just did like reenactments through the years to show visually how long we've been around, but to have a little bit more punch than maybe, you know, old, old video, black and white video or something like that. But um, so that was really the idea. And that was a cool example of that, I think, was you're doing something new. And the traditional thing would be like, well, let's hammer home every product feature on this, etc. But um, you can go to our website and see that you can see it in the product description, you can you can figure those things out. So for our, our big campaign and, and commercials, it was highlight the history highlight that you can trust us. So with with any brand that's getting 25, 50 years, I mean, there's turnover with people, right? And I think that's the danger. Um, with, you know, if companies don't have a committee or an archivist who's who's actively preserving that history, I mean, people leave and they take stuff with them, and 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 things just disappear, right? Because there's not that consistent um, effort to tie tie the thread, you know, um, tie that thread of history um, of a brand. And and our archive is kind of a testament to that. I mean, the number of brands that have come and gone that I'd never heard of before we started getting into this is is kind of astounding. So um, I could see how it, it would be easy for a brand to lose its way in a sense um, or stray from what made them great or what made them what they are. Um, I mean, how much do you play a role in that of, of ensuring that the brand stays true uh, but also continues to evolve? And I, we've certainly seen um, Carhartt evolve um, in, in the last few years and has, has especially taken off and, and resonates with, with a lot of people today. Yeah, it's, that's a really good question. It's, it's really, it's great to work at Carhartt um, because within the different, you know, pretty much every department, but, you know, I work predominantly with, with marketing and product design that, you know, people are often, you know, they're coming to me trying to either get inspiration or to sort of make sure that, you know, the plans that we have and what they're doing are in keeping with, you know, with our values and our history. So uh, it kind of makes it a little bit easier for me because I often have people trying to be concerned and make sure that, you know, what they're doing is in keeping with, with who we are as a brand historically. Um, I think another part of it is the fact that um, they just really, you know, there's, there's a move, really big move to include heritage elements in, in new product, you know, that, that kind of history, um, like you said, you can't, you can't buy it, you can't manufacture it. So, you know, we see often digging into old camouflage patterns or, or you know, uh, even like um, just graphics and things even from marketing and advertising that we use. So, you know, there's a lot of motivation on the part of others to come to me. And that is also the fact that, um, you know, I've, I've been very the the other thing that about corporate archives and kind of the business archive side of things is you're fighting for your funds, you're fighting for visibility, especially early on. So there's a lot of that, you know, ROI you're having to demonstrate from the very beginning. Um, and so I worked really hard to to do that, you know, and to make us, you know, along with the partners that were really helpful in getting the archive established in the first place within the business. So um, the fact that we've become so visible and that's that you know, people know we're here and um, often I'll have someone 
you know, a friend of mine meets someone in the area who works at Carhartt and, you know, they're like, oh, Dave, Archive Dave, I know him, you know, he works with him. So we've become visible within the company, which then gets people coming to me. So it's kind of a give and take where I keep abreast of the new products being created and the marketing campaigns that we're developing in order to interject the history into it or figure out how it can play with it. But then as much as that happens, it's people coming to me wanting to involve the history in something or make sure what they're doing is kind of in keeping with values and all that. So it's really become a great give and take over the last, you know, almost seven years now. It's hard to believe. <laughs> right. Uh, well, maybe maybe a final question um, uh, for you, but what, what are the R, what is the ROI of an archive? And I know that's something that, that we run into a lot is, um, you know, maybe there's brands out here or in the audience, even people at, at our, you know, at different companies that they want to establish something, but they don't know where to start. Or they don't know how to talk to management about how do we establish this or justify it? Um, if you could give, you know, maybe a pitch as to you know, why archives, that'd be great. Well, you know, in all honesty, the, the real base thing that, that is, uh, is pretty, you know, pretty clear is that the more you can reuse the old um, to, you know, have involvement now, it's, I mean, when you boil it down, it can be very cost saving, you know, the fact that you have somebody who's um, maintaining all this stuff and able to bring it back. Um, there were, you know, there's a lot of times where, you know, we'll, we'll have planned stuff, say for social media that includes the heritage, but often it's like, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have a good plan for something to do for this or that. So let's pull something from the archive and feature some history to do it. So I kind of got started on that where I could sort of fill in a gap when somebody didn't quite know what to do um, at a certain time. And so you get to be all of a sudden you're that role, you know, when you first start off of kind of being, you know, I, I'll say it kind of the fallback for things. But then the more that you do that, um, you're able to just keep reusing material. We, we did a, uh, uh, commercial a few years ago where we were talking about our Carhartt chore coat because it was celebrating our hundredth its hundredth anniversary in 2017, which was actually a discovery made by the archive. We didn't know, you know, the official intro year of it until we dug in and did some research. So we created a commercial where we reused footage that we had done from other commercials, but then we used a whole bunch of archival material to kind of flash on the screen and feature. So essentially you're creating, you know, you can almost create a whole marketing campaign around reuse. But the other side of it is really getting people to think about the archive, not so much as just the keeper of the old stuff that's 100 years old, but the fact that what you're doing right now in the design department, the, the new technologies you're bringing in, the way you're evolving our garments, the new things that you're creating, this is all the archive now too. Like this is, this is the future. So documenting what's going on right now really gets people, I don't, you know, that might be sort of riding the line of like ROI, but it's good to get people excited about it because you are letting them know that they're an active part of the history of the company. You know, you, you think about an archive and you think about the stuff locked away in the vault. That's, you know, the old overalls with the heart shaped buttons and all that kind of stuff that we used to have. But, you know, it's, it's really changing the idea of an archive from being something static and old to something that's active and always trying to connect past to present and, and really continue the story that's been over 130 years in the making. That's incredible. So in addition to, you know, watching your eBay alerts for old items, <laughs> you're also having to make sure the company's, you know, taking care of everything new that's coming out. Yeah, it's for sure. Weather. And I got to give a big shout out to our product design department because they really, they care. They, they save stuff. You know, our, our, one of the, the top folks um, in our product design department, Deb Ferraro, she really started that official department in, in, you know, back in the nineties, like she, she was the, we really didn't have a lot of formal product design going on. So, you know, she has a motivation to save stuff too, you know, so it's, you, you find your champions and you find the different people that, that share um, that desire to preserve and you just, you bank on them and, and, and you work together to, to make sure that you're capturing as much as you can about how your brand is evolving and changing, but also how that's still rooted in a kind of way of doing things that's been around since the beginning. It's a really great dynamic give and take. That's amazing. Well, Dave, 
thank you so much. I mean, the work you're doing is incredible. Um, our podcast that we did together will be coming out hopefully in a couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that, everyone. And make sure to follow Archive Dave. I, I included uh, his Instagram account in, in the chat. So thanks. It's been great. Appreciate it. Of course. And I'd, um, I'm going to drop a little plug to you just because Dave mentioned Deb, who is one of the most badass women ever. I had the um, pleasure of interviewing both Deb and Dave a few years ago for a Cordura project called Meet the Maker. I'll drop that link if, to the YouTube um, in the chat, but Deb expands on a little bit more of the history. And then there's some um, behind the scenes shots of the actual Carhartt archive, which I had the pleasure of hanging out in for a few days. And it was absolutely fascinating. Um, Dave, I really appreciate you joining us. And um, we're gonna welcome our next guest and final panelist, Brian Kelly. So Brian is coming to us from a very different perspective. He's neither a historian or working um, with a brand. He is a, a, a collector who actually came to collecting um, from photography. And um, tell us where you are, what you do, um, and where you're based. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my name is Brian Kelly. I'm uh, located up in Lumberland, New York, which is about two and a half hours northwest of New York City. I used to live in Brooklyn for the last like 13 years, but recently moved up here. Um, my background is really in still life photography and through still life, there's just so much repetition to like photographing product and clothing, whatever. And it just kind of became this natural transition into documenting and archiving things. Um, I started with uh, Metro cars, which is what let me go into the New York city transit authority objects book. And then past that it went into the national park maps book parks. Um, and then that's even what's led me now into starting Gathering Growth Foundation. So you're, um, you were an amateur collector who came to collecting through photography and this admiration for objects and, and still lives and creating those compositions. Um, you started off with your um, collecting uh, tokens, metro cards, and ephemera from the New York City subway systems, which is fascinating in itself. And then you went on to publish a book with standards manual based on those findings, correct? Yep. yep. Cool. Um, yeah, I yeah. have two of the standards manual books on the EPA and NASA. So I have to get your book on national parks. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit more how that rolled into the national parks um, collecting and how that started. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we finished up uh, the New York City Transit Authority Objects book. And for myself, there was just this like, okay, I just worked on this for almost seven years of collecting and building up this archive to be what it was. And then all of a sudden it was done. And I was like, all right, well, what's next? And trying to keep up with this like forward momentum, I just started going on eBay, looking up uh, random searches for things that are, again, I think going to like uh, things that Chase and Dave brought up was um companies that have been around for 25 50 100 years and kind of digging through and trying to find out if there's companies that don't really have an archives department and trying to figure out where you could like step in and like bring all this amazing um all these amazing items to life which is what kind of led me to the national park maps um so yeah basically i just started going on ebay and i spent almost two years on ebay uh setting up alerts and everything like that and um i think i have right now like 1200 maps and i think that the parks book had like 360 i think wow that's incredible yeah. um and i first actually found out about the account through um field mag and mm -hmm. a good friend of ours graham um everyone here could probably give him a shout out we owe something to graham mm -hmm. in some way um and i went immediately to the instagram account and I realized like this was a great opportunity to like make something archival or a collectible more accessible to a bigger audience. Mm -hmm. What kind of momentum or new audiences have you started engaging with since you've taken it to something like a visual platform that's a bit more democratic? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's kind of what that's kind of why I've been able to start these archives or all, um, it's like on a digital platform, especially is because you have everybody always usually just gets to see, see like the singular item. And when you're able to bring everything in this one cohesive manner on the digital platform, then you can get it out to many more people. It's, it's just trying to bring more, or just trying to educate people more on the history of something, I guess. 
Um, so how, and they how can you expect you to have like all the answers and know all the details and like a little bit, but yeah, I mean, again, it's just like for this, it's just like a continual learning process and it's more of just like, a how, how do I get to educate as many people on the history of the national parks and not just let them think that it's like, oh, you have Yosemite, Yellowstone, and just like the Grand Canyon. It's like, oh, there's like hundreds of national parks, monuments, historic sites, recreation areas, seashores, all these places all over the United States. And I think the parks book kind of like allows people to almost have this like visual hit list of the places that they want to go to, or even like allowing them to uh, remember a trip that they went on that they might have forgotten. Mm -hmm. And do you, you know, I'm wearing my national, one of my like national park shirts with Smokey the Bear on it that Noah made. Um, it's interesting to see how like the history of the national parks is influencing popular culture, apparel, you know, streetwear, fashion, whatever. Do, do mm -hmm. brands reach out to you to like learn more, um, collaborate about that kind of stuff? Because I know there's a lot of licensing that goes into it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I have gotten reached out to by a uh, parks project and I actually ended up just doing some like uh, commercial photography for them for a lookbook. Um, but again, yeah, it's like, I can't really do too much because of it being, you know, all these other agencies out there. So, I mean, with the parks project or the parks book, it was like, it's all public domain. So it was a little easier to try to make this book. Um, so we didn't have to go through like an approvals process, but I, I actually wanted to do a Smokey the Bear book, um, but it's licensed through the Department of Agriculture. And then it was like all these different licenses throughout like the US and China and everywhere like that. So it just became a legal nightmare to try to make that book. Um, I was wearing this shirt once at Outdoor Retailer and someone came up to me and they're like, how did you get the license for that? And I was like, I'm, I'm just wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> it's not, yeah. Much, but yeah, it's a whole yeah. thing. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, um, bureaucracy, uh, yeah. capitalism are alive and well. Um, okay, so, so that's where you started collecting and, and, and it was based on ephemera and objects and the history and legacy of, you know, things like the MTA and the national parks. And now you've evolved into a whole very new space of an abstract yeah. kind of approach to thinking about archiving, which is your new project. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so over the last four years, I've been photographing uh, national champion trees and champion trees are nominated as the largest of their species in the United States. And, um, for a while, I was working with American Forest, who is the oldest environmental nonprofit in the country. And um, they had, since 1940, they had this archive of all of the oldest and largest trees in the country. And, but it was only ever focused really on like the singular champion. And then the more I was doing research, I was finding out about all these other trees outside of just the very specific champion tree, um, which is kind of was like, okay, well, I don't want my efforts to be in vain. I'm, I don't want to just be going to these areas to photograph one specific tree. I want to be able to photograph as many as I can. And so um, historical trees, landmark trees, trees of significance, old growth forests, uh, second growth forests, depending on their uh, level, um, and just trying to archive them in the most cohesive way ever. So. The goal is to have a system set up for every single tree or forest I go to, usually spending a day to two days, depending on where I am, having, wow. sounds, having soundscape recording, scale photos, measurements of all these areas, um, and allow it to become an educational platform so people can go and kind of get this idea of what was or what, what makes a tree become this big and help curve like the shifting baseline and how we perceive trees in our everyday lives. So my brain jumps to like Chase's question that he had for Dave, what's the ROI on archiving trees? But <laughs> funny joke. Um, what about, um, who's supporting you in this project? You know, is this uh, nonprofit? Yeah, so, so, so for the last uh, three or four years, I was able to have private donors. Um, so I have a fiscal sponsor and they allow me to keep this all going. Uh, our goal definitely is to become a 501c3 um, and then be able to partner with brands and reach a much larger audience and help educate people in inner cities or just the general public on the importance of trees in our everyday lives and allowing them to kind of get this idea of like the history of the U.S. and 
um, what can what a tree can grow to be and also the benefits it has. I love it. Yeah, um, yeah I, I have to mention, I mean, Brian, and I included this in the chat, Brian was the main inspiration for our collection um, and, and how we, you know, put our materials on, on Instagram, first of all. So I should, I should shout out um, that, but I just think your story is so interesting how you've been able to tie like traditionally what we think of as archival work, right. Preserving documents to now preserving, like, uh, I don't know, play, not, yeah. not just places, but like living, living things right through photography and, and champion. I hadn't even heard about champion trees until I saw your work. And, and with, you know, that combination of your archival interests and, and photography, um, I mean, you're able to, to photograph these trees in a way that's very moving, right? And I built, you develop an attachment to these, these living things, which is really interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I feel like we, you have more of a captive audience than maybe ever before, because people are a little bit more cued in or aware of, you know, regenerative agriculture or environmentalism in general is becoming totally. more mainstream. So maybe there's more people totally. who are, are paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. And also I think, you know, um, to Chase's like back, going back like two seconds ago when Chase brought up like creating these systems of how things are archived and displayed on Instagram or on the internet. Um, that was one thing that made me want to get into archiving even more was applying a creative process to an archive. Cause an archive, you know, what Dave was saying, I think earlier, uh, you know, most archives just sit in these filing cabinets or in these dark places and temperature controlled rooms, which is amazing because of, from a preservation standpoint, it's like the best, but it's like, how do you do, how do you, how do you create an archive that's going to be visually beautiful that will inspire people to care about it? You know, it's like, it's the same way that I'm doing the Gathering Growth Foundation and photographing all these trees is because so much of the information and data out there or research is just like, thick, thick textbooks where like, unless you're extremely passionate about it, you're not going to apply yourself to it. But if you can go to a website, see these beautiful images and get like quick little blurbs of information, like those can kind of be like the initial spark for inspiration to like keep going or keep educating yourself. So that's kind of where I see uh, what I'd like to do with gathering growth or other archives in general. One thing that I've, I mean, has always stuck with, with me when Brian, we first got connected and I learned about your different archival projects. And I think you and I talked about this earlier as, as well as what you're doing with Gathering Growth is, is if, if we don't do this work, right? Like who will, and you and I talked about this, right? It's like only you have like some, you know, a, a niche interest, right? And like, maybe you're the one person who's like super passionate about that thing. It's like, well, you can be the one that preserves that, right? There's yeah. just so much out there that can be preserved. Um, it takes all of us to try to do that work in one way or another. And, and mm -hmm. it's one thing that I've always found really, um, really amazing about the work that you do is like, well, if you're not doing it, whatever, would anyone else step up and, and do it? Yeah. Right. It yeah, takes people absolutely. just, just creating it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also just like so much of, um, I'm also trying to do the gathering growth project at like the highest quality possible. So it's a mix of digital and film large format photography, which was something that when I was first stumbling upon a lot of these tree archives, they were like, a, all the information was there, but it was like these cell phone photos. And I was like, here's like, you know, here's one of the best examples of like the oldest trees in the world. And it's a cell phone photo. What like a horrible way to be preserved. I like, pre like this tree's legacy to be preserved and shown to the world. So how do we like make this tree look the best way? So that's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so, sunset, sunset and sunrise always. Um, well, I'd love to open it up to questions. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, and I, Lisa's going to jump on. She's our content director at Rain. She's going to jump back on the video to uh, queue up some of those questions we have. Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I've been taking so many notes and um, I just wanna thank you all so much for your time and your energy today. Um, anybody else who might have a, a last minute question, just feel free to drop them in the chat for us and we'll try to get them um, before we close out today. Uh, but we do have a couple lined up for our speakers. Um, so our first one for today is uh, Dr. Gross, what balance do you think 50 plus year old brands should strike between celebrating their heritage and pushing forward 
to create a more inclusive and transparent industry? Uh, I mean, if you're asking a historian and not somebody who's invested in a business, you're probably going to get different answers. Um, for the most part, when I see the word heritage invoked, it usually is racially coded. And so I would say we need to drop it because heritage means a narrow history for some, right? There's no such thing as women's heritage before the 1970s as if women didn't exist or their clothes, right? Similarly, the military heritage style also only invokes a certain set of soldiers, not all people. And so in that sense, I would push back strongly against that. But again, that's not a business perspective. That's, that's my kind of uh, historical ethics perspective. Love it. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Um, all right. So our second question, again, if anybody else has any last minute questions, just feel free to drop them in the chat for us. Um, Question number two, do you see NFTs as a way to revive archives and digitally connect with consumers? This is for all the panelists. This is that's a terrifying thing. <laughs> yes. I, 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 can, I can jump in and I, yeah, you know, just from a, uni, I, from a university perspective, I, universities are pretty slow to adopt anything um, really new um, or unknown. Um, and, and Clint, our archivist is, you know, you can let me know if I'm saying anything wrong here, but I think universities are just slow to, to, you know, look at anything like that. The other question for us is ownership, right? Like we are scanning these materials and making them available, but we didn't produce them. Um, so that's, that's another question, right? The question of ownership. I mean, I'll, I'll just say that from a historian's perspective, you know, my interest isn't in the consumers except as an analytical category. And so in that sense, I actually see, widespread access, not narrowing it down as one of the most important things that archives could provide if they chose to. Um, so from a historian's perspective, that's not a direction I would love to see happen. Yeah, I and, and first, of, first of all, I'll admit my uh, lack of 100% understanding of NFTs at this point, but I, I would just, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, echo what what Dr. Gross said that you know, in the archives world is, it's all about access, really. So um, that the direction we're going is always for making things more, more accessible and more widely uh, disseminated rather than, than going the other way. But um, that's with limited knowledge of <laughs> NFTs and all that goes into that. So thanks. Awesome. Yeah, all right. So we've got, oh, we got one more. Oh, we got one more question for the group. And I think uh, we might have to wrap it up for today. Um, all right, any insight into how much of the past comes into play in designing future seasons, styles, et cetera? I'm sure this differs brand to brand, but would love to hear anyone's method to the madness. Um, I should probably start just because I have the history of that. Um, beginning in the 1920s, outdoor and workwear companies started advertising and marketing their um, authentic roots in the late 19th century. So uh, that question goes back at least 100 years. That's a starting point anyway. It. Yeah, I can I can speak to that. Um, I think you know, for me, it 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 usually comes in one of two ways. Um, either someone uh, within our product design department is is coming to me, or I'm working with them on you know future line planning two three years out, and we're looking to um, you know do some new things with our denim offerings. We're looking to do some new things with camouflage patterns or just graphic patterns in general, and and all that kind of stuff. So I will pull the materials, bring them in, and it's sort of an inspiration session where something might hit, something might not. It might just be more educational about what have we done in the past, or we might literally use an old pattern or an old pocket styling or something like that to actually create a new, a new garment. And then from the other side of things, um, it's me bringing a lot of times product anniversaries uh, in particular, but you know, bringing things and saying, we have something to celebrate that I know of because of my familiarity with the history. So let's create, you know, we create a new product that's either a straight reproduction of it or very much more heavily influenced by it than just being some design details. So it kind of can come in in two ways um, of either being sort of initiated by the archive or being something that the archive is supporting that's kind of already being discussed. Um, awesome. Well, we have come to the end of this journey, which has been so 
exciting and riveting for all of us that love uh, nerding out over gear and product and the history of, and I'm sure we could all continue this conversation for hours. Um, just to wrap things up as a reminder, um, we will be sending out a recording to everyone who has joined us today. And in addition to that, you'll be also receiving a free month subscription to the Range newsletter or the Horizon Report newsletter that's published by Range. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy that. That's four issues coming into your inbox every Tuesday morning. Um, if you wanna learn more about what we do at Range, you can find us at This Is Range on all the socials. And I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for their time today value this so much. It's so nice to connect. I know we're all feeling disconnected from each other and these little glimpses um, of each other's faces and voices and insights just kind of make us feel like we're a little bit more grounded. Um, so thank you again for joining us and um, I hope we can all continue to keep this conversation rolling. Mm -hmm.